Um, I find it interesting that when we say love in the English language, it's just love. We love everything. We love it equally. We love dogs. We love food. We love uh, various things, correct? And we don't make a discrimination of what kind of love we're talking about. I certainly love my children more than I love my dog. <laughs> Even my grandchildren, yes, I love her more than I love my dog. That's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> because I dote on my dog, but she doesn't live with me, so I can't dote on her all the time. <laughs> Get myself in trouble here. All right. Okay, let's turn to Romans 5.5. 5. Now, when we're looking at the, at the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, in the New Testament, we are seeing a lot of talking about love. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, Jesus talked about love. Peter talked about love. Now, Peter had a little problem with his love. He couldn't figure out what kind of love he loved with. And uh, though I'm not going to go on that today, I'll probably do that the next time I, I teach. Uh, Peter had his problems knowing what kind of love he loved the Lord with. Then Paul talked a lot about love. And Paul talked a lot because he wrote most of the New Testament. And then John. Well, John was really an apostle of love. And he talked <coughs> a lot about love in the Gospel of John and in John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, love was a big topic. In fact, John referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus dearly loved and highly esteemed all throughout the book of, of the Gospel of John. So he understood that God loved him. And my concern has always been that we don't really understand that God loves us and we don't understand what kind of love God loves us with. Because if he's going to love us with brotherly love, then depending on how your brothers have treated you, what are you going to expect from God by, by the experience you've lived in your life? If he's going to love us with motherly love, well, we could say, oh, that's so reassuring. But it may not be reassuring to everybody. If you remember in the Old Testament, the mothers uh, cooked their children. Uh, things didn't go so well in those days. So motherly love is not going to take you clear through, <laughs> what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Especially if they're hungry. <laughs> but God's love, the love that gives at his own expense and expects nothing back. That's the kind of love that's not pre-qualified. Now, I don't know about you, but as I was growing up, my parents would say to me, well, if you do good, we love you. If you get good grades, we love you. And some of you, your parents may have said, oh, we love you because you did right. Uh, but so if you did wrong, you knew they didn't love you anymore. That's a converse thing happens. And in our minds as children, we flip that around. So we figure if we did bad, we're not loved. If we do good, we're loved. Then we get jealous of somebody else who does good more than we do good. And then there's all this conflict in the family. And it becomes a very um, negative, uh, destructive situation. But God's love to us is uh, a restoring love. His, his love is that he chose us. He chose us. Not only did he choose us, he chose us before the time he created us. We were kind of uh, talking this morning uh, in our Sunday school class about, we're talking about finances, but it gets all into all kinds of different things, and we're talking about choosing, making righteous choices, and how sometimes we don't know what we're choosing. And then I said about when I married Pastor George uh, some 54 years ago, and the next day I was on the phone, how could you let me marry this stranger? I told my mother, how could you let me marry this stranger? And in 24 hours, I hadn't been married, and I didn't know the man. I loved him, but I didn't know him. And we've got to consider that, don't we? Well, God knew us before we ever were. And he chose us. He chose us. He created us. He made us just like he wanted to make us. 
So we don't disappoint God in our makeup. So whether you're short or tall, whether you're broader or thinner, whether you're male or female, no matter where you come from, you are not a disappointment to God because he created mankind and he looked on mankind, humanity, and he said what? It is good. It is very good. It is very good. And I think this is incredible because the problem that we see always being talked about in society is self-worth. Self-worth. I want to tell you something. If God said you were very good, you are very good. He's not going to lie. I mean, that's the end of it right there. Now, whether you look in the mirror and you don't like it, well, that's another thing. If you believe he made you very good, then you have to look in the mirror and say, mm, that ain't so bad, actually. <laughs> I mean, he knew me. Before I loved him, he knew me. From the beginning of the, before the beginning of the foundation of the world, God knew us. Before we were even created in his image, he knew us and he knew there would be problems and he gave his son for us because he loved us. He loved us. And you could say, well, because he created us, he would naturally love us. Well, that's not really true because we can all create something. Some of us are talented to create things, beautiful pieces of jewelry or artwork, and yet in our creation, we can always look in there and find something we did wrong. We can always see what we could have done better and what we're disappointed in with what we created. Now, God looked at us and he said, it's very good. Now, that's bigger than my mind. And that's bigger than my understanding, to be truthful with you. Because God said we were very good. He said he looked on us from the time we were conceived in the womb. And he watched us being embroidered in beautiful colors and, and made like we are. And so, I don't know about you, I always wanted to be taller. And I had a cousin who was six foot one. She was beautiful to me. She was so tall, really. But then when I got born again and I began to see God said I was very good, I knew there was a reason for short people too. <laughs> it was very good. It was very good. I'm serious. And God has his love for us. He chose us. And he knows us. And this choice of his means that he's giving everything to us because he chose to, not because we deserved it. Jesus came to die not because we deserved a Savior. God knew we needed one. But deserving it? No. Oh, that's why we're so happy that we have mercy instead of justice. God gave and he expected what back? Nothing. Nothing back. You say, well, then why do we have to do anything for God? We don't have to do anything for God. You don't have to do anything for God. You get to. Because if you love someone, then you're going to give. And especially when you're born again, because you have God's nature in you, become more of a giver than you ever were. And so this, this loving and this giving <coughs> is, is something that God has created to make us what he sees us to be. Lovely, lovable, love-worthy. Oh, I mean, we should have no problem with self-esteem as children of God because we're not looking at ourselves. Selfishness is the problem. Selfishness is sin. Selfishness is missing the mark. Looking on ourselves is more, is more uh, against uh, the knowledge of God because looking at God brings us out of ourselves and into who he is and who we are in him and who he is in us. And then we realize, wow, he loves me. He just loves me. That's a pretty awesome thing, isn't it? 
All right, let's turn to Romans 5, 5. Let's get there. Praise the Lord. And hope shall, this is the um, King James, hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So when we are born again, and God comes to dwell in us, and the Holy Spirit brings us into new life, then we have God's love in us. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I've looked at this scripture. In fact, most of the time, previous to not too long from now, or past now, uh, it says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. And we can take that and we can say, well, it's shed abroad, so we're supposed to give it to everybody else. How many kind of think that? Yeah, yeah. He's shed abroad in our hearts to give to everybody else. It's actually, when you read the various translations, what it's saying is that the shedding abroad is when it came from him out to us. We're the abroad. We're the out there. God is love. He shed his love abroad onto us, in us. He shed it in us. Now, what we do with that is because of God's <coughs> nature in us, and we give agape love. We give this unqualified love to others, which makes love one of the most difficult things that you'll ever have to do secondary, probably to, to forgiveness. Although I think forgiveness and love work together. But love is a tough thing. Having a, a to walk in the love of God will stretch you out of your absolute skin. It makes us, um, well, I think the scripture says to us, hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is in us. Because the love of God is in us. We are not ashamed. We uh, find a reason for living. We find the fact that, well, I think the psalm said, all we need is love. <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, that love was not the kind of love that God had. We need God's love because the other kind of loves are not going to fix us. Mother tried to fix us, and Mother did the best she could. I'm not saying anything against Mother, but Mother can't fix what's inside. Brothers try to fix you. Oh, you know that your brothers and, and your peers, they all try to fix you. They, they don't hesitate to tell you what's wrong with yourself. But they can't fix you. And, of course, lust is never going to fix you. You think it's going to fix you, but it's not going to fix you. It's going to cause more problems, wreak havoc inside. But God's love is restorative. God's love heals. God's love cures. God's love, God's love makes us not ashamed because he loves us. Let me read this to you in another version. In the Weymouth version, it says, This hope is no delusive one, as is proved by the fact that the brimming river of God's love has already overflowed into our hearts, on drawn by his Holy Spirit, which he has given to us. You see, God's already giving, and giving, and giving, and giving, and giving. We have because he gave. We have because he gave. Uh, the Century Bible says, For through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, the brimming river of the love of God has overflowed in our hearts. Wow, the brimming river. There's a river of love. A river of love. Now, we, we think about the scripture in Revelation where there's a river that flows out from underneath the throne of God. There's a river of love. We see that river in Revelation. Many times we see it as healing. That river has trees beside it with leaves that fall into that river, and those, those leaves bring healing, says to the nations, bring healing. But it's the river is full of love. It's full of love. It's what nurtures us. Uh, Blackman says, God's love has there been poured forth into and continues inundating our hearts. Woost says, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts and still floods them. So the love of God is never going to be exhausted as it's poured out into our hearts and into our lives. We cannot uh, 
use up all the love that God has for us. We can't, actually, what Paul says is we can't even comprehend it. It's so high and wide and long and deep, this love of God that he has for us. And our experience with love is so natural, so fleshly, so in this world type of love, whereas his love is so supernatural and outside of this world. Uh, the challenge with the love of God is that it comes into our lives and it smacks right up against the love of self. That makes a, does that make a tsunami? <laughs> what does that make? That makes a big collision, doesn't it? When the love of God, so a self, unselfish, so selfless, so giving, and we like, I can't take that kind of love. I don't know what to do with that kind of love. I'm not demanded to do anything with that kind of love. Uh, surely I must have to do something. We don't have to do anything. Like I said, we can, we get to do things. And we don't do them uh, because we have to. We get to do them because of love. Love. God so loved us that while we were yet his enemies, he sent Jesus Christ to die for us. That's incredible to me. It makes me want to cry when I hear it. I mean, when I was his enemy, he did that happened to Jesus when I was still his enemy out of love. I don't understand that kind of love. I am thankful for it. But that kind of love comes in and just slams our, our thinking. It, it takes everything and makes it different. I've got to look for Galatians 5, uh, 6. I think that's, no, 5.24. Galatians 5.24, I'm sorry. Galatians 5.24. It says here, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. The New Life Bible says, those of us who belong to Christ have nailed our old sinful selves on his cross. Our sinful desires are now dead. Wow. It's amazing, isn't it? Those who belong to the Messiah, Jesus, have by sharing his death, thereby slain upon his cross their sensual nature with his passions and its cravings. When we are in Christ, the flesh, together with his emotions and its desires, are dead on the cross. They become dead to us. We are alive in Christ. We are alive in the realm of the Spirit. This collision, this collision of the love of God with the selfishness of man will lead to the death of the flesh. Don't worry. There's nothing you have to do. It will happen because God is ever working in you both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. And his own good pleasure is to love you to death Amen. so that you might be raised to life. Amen. Amen? And the more the flesh goes, the more life you have. And so it makes life that we know so much more abundant. And that's what abundant life really is. The challenge is that the flesh dies easy. No, that flesh dies hard. The flesh dies really hard. I'm telling you, it dies hard hard but the river of God's love so overwhelms overwhelms the sensual nature overwhelms the natural man that it brings with it the zoe the zoe the eternal life of God and so though we are in this world we are not of this world when we are first born again we find ourselves in a very strange place Ooh, it's different somehow. Uh, things don't look the same. Things don't seem the same, and we can't figure out what the difference is and how do we relate to one place to another. And God begins to work this in us by his love. His love is, comes to us through the person of the Holy Spirit 
and then it becomes a, a huge wave of the love of God that just begins to fix everything within us. Our only relationship to love is our experience. So then when we begin to experience God's love, God's love makes all other love seem like a chore. We always have to work for it. We always have to give something back. It's always demanding of us. It doesn't always present itself as we would like love to present itself. And yet, when we begin to realize what love is, we're like, how could we ever live there? How could we ever be like that? And I want you to turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. These are the, this is a description of love. God's love. Agapeo love. This is the, the description. Now don't get in despair as we read this because remember the Holy Spirit is in you helping your infirmities and bringing this river of love through you and, and, and washing away the things of the flesh. All right. Charity? This is charity. You know charity is a word for love. Acapella love, charity, charity. The word, uh, the root word is um, charis, C-A-R-U-S, and in the old um, English languages, it meant dear, or beloved, or treasured. Uh, the this kind of charity, and it doesn't mean the brotherly love, like we said, gives charity. It is a word for the love of God, the way that it's used. Out of that comes all that other word, all those other meanings. And so, we see that charity suffereth long. Amplified says, love endures long and is patient and kind. Hayford's uh, translation says, love suffers long, having patience with imperfect people. Ooh, oh, my goodness. Let's see. Uh, here's one. This love, which I speak, is slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive. Love is never envious or boils over with jealousy. That's the love of God. You know, God, doesn't, God rejoices when you achieve. God rejoices as you grow in him. You don't threaten God by getting better. You know what I'm saying? In the world, if you achieve, many times you threaten your peers. Well, thank God he's not your peer. He is not threatened by you. You don't change him. You remember the Bible says that uh, if you don't believe in him, he still is. Don't worry, he still is. There's always time. Right? Mm-hmm. Charity envieth not. Love is patient and kind. Never envious, nor boils over with jealousy. Is not boastful or vainglorious. Boastful or vainglorious. Love does not envy, Hayford says. Since it is non-possessive and non-competitive, it actually wants others to get ahead. How great a world would it be? How great would the church be? How great would the family be if we loved each other with this kind of love where we only wanted each other to get better? We wanted everybody to get ahead. We wanted everybody to achieve and to do well. Non-possessive, non-competitive. How many people are competitive? Well, it's a few people that admit to being competitive. I think we're, most of us are in the flesh, in the natural man. We're competitive, either with ourselves or with others. Competitive. 
I wasn't ever a sports person, but I did com like compete with myself. I always wanted to be better than I was, which is kind of negative also, because then you can never be good enough to please yourself. But God is here to love you with a love that's going to help you achieve, a love that's going to change you. And uh, this kind of love uh, is something we're not used to. It doesn't parade itself. It isn't arrogant. <laughs> love has a self-effacing quality, the Hayford Bible says. It is not ostentatious. Ostentatious means uh, always bigger than life, uh, louder than everybody else more talented than everybody else. Sounds like people on speed, right? We are God, and there is none other in the peons that are below us because we have this drug-induced coma we're in. You know, ask a drug addict that's sobered up, they'll tell you. They thought they were it. It's, it's not that way. The love of God, even though he is God, he is not like God mankind. And we've got to realize that. And we can be like this. This challenges us, doesn't it? Challenges us to be more like God. His love is shed abroad in our hearts. From God comes this river of love into us. And it will re reconstitute, it will rearrange how we see ourselves and how we see others. As we see others differently, we will respond with that kind of love. That kind of love is a special kind of love that helps us to get better. It fixes us, brings us life, changes us, changes the situation around us. Now, let's go on here. Love is not puffed up, treating others arrogantly. It does not behave rudely, but displays good manners and courtesy. Hmm. That means it's not selfish, isn't it? All those are selfish, selfish acts. Puffed up, ostentatious, treating others arrogantly. Love does not seek its own, insisting on its own rights, and and demanding precedence. Rather, it is unselfish. Unselfish. It's unhuman. It's supernatural. It's not something we've ever experienced before. Unselfish. Sin is the result of self and selfishness. We want what we want when we want it. And if we don't get it, then we have attitudes. We all know this. I mean, I have to go ahead and talk to you about the flesh. We've all been there. But this love of God, we've not all been there. We've not all comprehended some of it. And I, I want to comprehend more of it. I want you to comprehend more of it. And so I heard someone say, if we have knowledge... Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If we have knowledge, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. If we have knowledge, it will build our faith and our knowledge of supernatural things. Like the love of God. Like the love of God. And it's hard to explain the love of God. Love is not provoked, this love. I'm still reading from the Hayford version. It is not irritable or touchy rough or hostile, but it is graceful under pressure. Not irritable, not touchy, not provoked. I guess you can't make love mad. You can't make that kind of love mad. There's no sense trying, is there? When you have that kind of love, you can't. Love thinks no evil. It doesn't keep an account of wrongs done to it. Instead, it erases resentments. 
This is an unselfish love, graceful under pressure. Graceful under pressure. I don't know about you, but I have met people that are graceful under pressure. I have always wanted to be more like that. I guess I'll get my wish as I know God better. Graceful under pressure. Because usually when the, when the pressure starts coming on and stress and things are not going right, that's when the natural man takes over. And we began to act in a way that's not going to be helping anybody. But the love of God is graceful under pressure. The more pressure, the more graceful it is. It's just like an orange, if you want to squeeze an orange. The more pressure, the more orange juice you get. Or lemons. The more pressure, the more lemons you get. Now, if you want to squeeze an onion, now you might get a little natural reaction, right? <laughs> that onion may get in the flesh. <laughs> There's a difference. What pressure brings out, isn't there? In various fruits and in various people. But the love of God is always graceful under pressure. That means you're not making him nervous. If you blow something or, or you're, you fail at something or, or you have a, a lack in what you did, He's not aggravated at all. He's just loving you through it. Loving you through it. It's a big difference to have the support of a love that expects nothing from you and is delighted with everything you do. If we had that towards one another, how would the world be? The more you fail, the more love you got. The more love you got, the less you fail. Because love makes you better. And it makes you more able to demonstrate, to teach, to walk in a place that's comfortable for you. God made you. He saw you. He, he made you. And he said you were very good. And he understands everything that goes on inside of us. When we feel rejected, when we feel sad, when we even feel envious. He knows about all of those things. And yet he says, I've poured some love out there into you. It's going to fix all that. It's going to fix all that. But when we get in those states, we don't always think about, oh, God's going to love me now because I did wrong. <laughs> Not the way it works, the way we grew up in the natural. But God's love never fails. It never fails. It doesn't think any evil. It doesn't look at you in the morning when you get up and say, well, I wonder what they're going to mess up today. <laughs> look at them, same as yesterday. Doesn't think evil. It, there's no way to think about you in a negative sense. Being greeted by the love of God every morning means you are the most beautiful thing on the planet Earth. You are very good because you are made in the image of God. And when you're born again, you have his spirit dwelling in you. Let's go on. Love does not rejoice at iniquity. He's not happy with sin, with things that miss the mark. Finding, he doesn't find satisfaction in the shortcomings of others or spreading an evil report. Whoa, gossip, whoa. Hmm, building ourselves up on the shortcomings of others. Rather, it rejoices in the truth, aggressively advertising the good and ignoring the negative, that the good might grow. What you take care of, what you concentrate on is going to grow. If you concentrate on fear, fear is going to grow. If you concentrate on God's kind of love, that kind of love is going to grow. I, I'm serious. It's just more care to a certain thing will bring you more of a produce or a, a harvest of that particular thing. This kind of love bears all things, defends and holds other people up, 
Love believes the best about others, credits them with good intentions, is not suspicious. Love hopes all things, never giving up on people, but affirming their future. Love endures all things, persevering and remaining loyal to the end. Love bears no malice. Love, God's love, God is not out to get you. He's not out to hurt you. God never parades himself and says, you could never be up here with me. No, he says what? You're seated at my right hand on the throne of grace because I love you and I built a throne for you of grace that you could have a place with me because I want you with me because I love you. I don't lust you. I love you. It just makes me happy to have you around. I, I just love that. You know, it's, it's interesting, this, this love of God. It's something we don't walk with every day. We don't think about it every day, but we really should set ourselves a, a goal of trying to let God's love work in us more. I remember when um, my dad was very ill before he died, and he was in the hospital, and my dad was never real demonstrative with his love. He took care of us, and he was kind, and he was a good caretaker, a caregiver, uh, to my mother when she was ill, before she passed. And um, so he was in the hospital, and he had never been one to say, I love you. I don't know if anybody ever had a father like that, but I mean, he was a good father. But he, he wasn't born again, but he, he just, he loved his kids, but he never said, I love you. And he was in the hospital, and I was getting ready to leave that night to go on home, and it was late. And um, as I went out the door, he said to me, he said, uh, Sissy, I love you. And I just was like running into the wall. He said it first. I used to always say to him, I love you, Dad. And he'd say, love you too. But he never initiated saying, I love you. And that night he said, Sissy, I love you. And I was like, wow, my dad really loves me. He said it first. I don't know, I was a grown woman. I don't know why this impacted me like that. So I got out and I'm walking down the hall and going out to the hospital. It was up here at um, Summerland, I think it was. Going, going around, going out the front door. And as I got to the front door, the spirit of the Lord, the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said to me, Sissy, I love you too. I, it just tore me up. I cried all the way to the car. I sat in the car and cried. It makes me want to cry right now. God loved me. And he said it first. He loves you. He's not afraid to say he loves you. He demonstrated he loved you in Jesus, when he gave Jesus, when you were yet his enemies, when you didn't know enough to know enough. He provided a way for you. Psalm 23 says he set a table before you in the presence of his enemies. He loves you. And that is so, uh, do I understand what he meant? Not really. But I know that it provoked a response in me that was like, changed my life, the way I saw things. First of all, it was great that my dad said that. But then when God said it, it was like, I don't know, the whole world went off in my head. My emotions were such a difference because God said he loved me and he said it first. And sometimes we just don't get that. And I want us all to begin to get that because I think it will change us. You see, perfect love casts out all fear. All fear, all anxiety, all need to protect self. Perfect love, God's love. Am I walking in that? Absolutely not. Do I still fight fear? Of course. There are times I fight fear, anxiety. We all do. But I remember perfect love casts out fear. If God loves me, I'm going to be all right. Amen. It doesn't matter what happens, I'm going to be all right. I can't explain how. I don't know what it's going to take to make it right. I don't know what it's going to take to change me or you or anybody else, and I can't do it myself, but I know that God's love never 
fails. Isn't that what it said to us? It never fails. It never fails. It gives us the power to endure anything. It never gives up on us. He's always this river of love is flowing through our lives in the realm of the spirit, which is splashing into the natural realm and cleaning off the banks of the river, if you would, of all the jealousies and all of the arguments and all the fears and all of the, the temptations. It's just washing them. You know, the bigger the river gets, the less junk is on the bank. In fact, it's hard to find the bank if you've really got a big river, I guess, isn't it? hard to find the bank of that river. All the stuff goes away. I don't know about you, I was really concerned about this cyclone or in Fiji because uh, one of our ministers is, is in Fiji with her family from California. And I say one of our ministers, we've been uh, very much involved with her and her church since her husband passed away. And, and she and her whole family were there in Fiji and all of the relatives were getting to see the the, the children, the grandchildren, they had not seen, and here comes this cyclone. And so it was, it was pretty amazing. I was praying, praying for them that they would miss it, since there's really two inhabitable islands there. But uh, after it passed, um, and Facebook is good for this, there was a thing that came up and said, uh, Mariani Dia was fine, everybody's safe. And that's all it said. It was like, <sighs> It's just interesting, isn't it? How storms can come and storms can shake us and, and waters can flow and flood and overwhelm. Can you imagine islands in the middle of the ocean like that and 184 mile an hour winds and all that water and you're around, all the water in the, was blown over you from the ocean and all the rain and all the water. And God's love prevails. God's love preserves his people. God's love is big enough to handle anything that would come towards us. No matter where we find ourselves, God's love, God's love never dies. God's love does not keep records of wrongs. God's love is eternal. God's love never fails. And so today, as, as we close this, I'm not even halfway done with my notes, and praise the Lord, because I feel the presence of God here. <coughs> and I think it's a good time for us to let God touch us. Hold me close, the song said that we sang this morning. Hold me close, Lord. I want you to just put everything out of your mind everything and let God hold you close and let him speak to you I love you too I love you more I love you more purely I love you eternally everything is going to be all right because my father's love never fails His love is always protecting me. I can always trust him. Father, we thank you that the love of God is pouring through our lives today. The purity 
the wonder of it all. Your love healing us. Emotionally, if you need a healing, or his, if you physically need a healing, let this perfect love just flow through that area right now. The river is flowing. The river of love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're making all things new again. bringing hope to the hopeless. Acceptance to the rejected. Strength to the weak. Peace to the troubled. That love that passes all understanding. That love that we can't measure. That love that just floods our being and restores our soul. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If we could pass communion. Let's just take communion while we're being so loved by God, recognizing his love to us, his love. Praise the Lord. We come to the table of the Lord because it's a love feast. Jesus said, do this as often as you come together. So we try to do that here. Recognizing that as we recognize and are thankful, the river flows. The river of the Holy Spirit carrying the love of God. Oh yeah, we will talk more about this times to come, but today I just sense the love of God in this place. And I can't explain it. But it'll fix all that ails you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Join us for services at Wellspring Church of All Nations, a dynamic church that lifts up the name of Jesus. We are meeting at 4870 Janelle Drive, located between Buffalo and Durango, with an entrance at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. 
Our focus is to win the lost, connect them to Jesus and his church, train them in the word of God, and help them find their place in the work of the Lord. Our service times are 10.45 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Sunday and 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-631-5027. That's 631-5027. Or you can visit our website, www.wellspringministries.com.